Hi, this is Manoj. This is Aparna. And welcome to Australia. Finally, a country where I don't need hours of grammar lesson just to be able to order a coffee. Finally, a country where I don't have to bore you with lengthy history lessons. And finally, a country where they are smart enough to get this me. Taylor Swift makes your videos go viral, they say. Good morning, day one of the trip. So today we are going to drive across the Great Ocean Road. That's how big the Great Ocean Road looks on the Australia map. Zoomed in, it is 240 kilometers long, connecting the towns of Torquay and Allen's Fort. We overnighted in Torquay the previous evening so that we could hit the road bright and early today. And here are the obligatory footage of our room and bathroom in Torquay. Basic functional hotel. The Great Ocean Road, believe it or not, is a war memorial, and that too the world's largest. Australia had sent a huge force to support the Allied war efforts during the First World War. And when the war was over, they now had several veterans who had to be housed and employed. And these veterans were youngsters in their 20s, without any college education. And what do you do with them? Put them to work on building one of the top 10 scenic roads on the planet. The resulting road was built between 1919 and 1932. Although the Great Ocean Road makes forays to the seashore, it doesn't always suck the coast and most of the lookouts are detours from the main path. And there are way too many of them and not all of them are well marked. So if you are not on a guided tour, you better come prepared with a checklist of lookouts to hit, otherwise you would miss the best bits. Our recommendation would be the Addis Point Lookout, Anglesey Lookout, Split Point Lighthouse, Teddy's Lookout, which was our personal favorite, Mariner's Lookout, and the Otway Lighthouse, which is a fair bit of a detour from the main road. Of course, the crowning glory is the Twelve Apostles Lookout. Everyone stops here and it is packed elbow to elbow even when the weather is grey and dreary. Most people end their journey here, but if you have your own transport, you should not miss the nearby Lock and Gorge and the London Bridge Lookouts. These formations seem timeless, but they keep changing all the time, constantly eroded by the relentless waves pounding on them. The Twelve Apostles, for example, were originally nine limestone pillars. Yes, nine and never twelve. I wonder how Australians won so many World Cups being this bad at counting. Where was I? Yes, the nine limestone pillars of Twelve Apostles, one of them fell down in 2003, permanently altering the seascape. And there were originally two London bridges, and as the rhyme goes, one of them did indeed fall down, that was in 1960s. And no, no attempts were made to build it back. That's the car we had hired for this uh, Great Ocean Road trip, bargain rental car, good decent one. This is our hotel room in Port Campbell, nice hotel, it has a sitting area and that's our bed and a spacious toilet. Very clean toilet. For lunch, we had this avocado sandwich at the Split Point Lighthouse, where this guy was giving us company. For dinner, we shared this veg pizza at a restaurant close to our hotel in Port Campbell. A good morning, day two from Australia. Uh, so we spent the night in Fort Campbell, and then today we are going to return the car in Melbourne and take a flight to Sydney. And then we'll rent a car in Sydney and then drive towards the Blue Mountains. And that's where we want to spend the night tonight. That's the route we took to the Melbourne airport. The first half was quite scenic. One lane road winding through idyllic farms, rolling hills and green pastures. We had this vegetarian ramen at the airport before catching the flight to Sydney. That's the route to the Blue Mountains from the Sydney airport. That's the 33 km long West Connex tunnel that helped us escape the Sydney traffic. The last stage of this tunnel system was opened just a few months ago in November 2023. Dinner was at an Indian restaurant in Katumba. The naan was fantastic, the rest I could have done better and I usually burn water. That's the car we hired for our uh, Blue Mountains trip and that's our room in Blue Mountains in Katumba, Sky Rider Inn. A uh, very small room though, that's the room and uh, the toilet. Good morning, day three from Australia. 
Uh, today we are driving around the Blue Mountains National Park and uh, we'll finish the day in Sydney and this is the Mount Banks viewpoint. Blue Mountains is located within an hour from the heart of Sydney and hence a popular weekend getaway for the Sydney siders. The mountains are famous for their views of dramatic limestone cliffs overlooking a canopy of eucalyptus trees. The fine mist of oil exuded by the trees gives the place the ethereal blue tinge and hence the name. For people spoiled by the excellent national park system of the US, the Blue Mountain National Park does not have a well demarcated park road with an entrance where a smiling lady hands out one of those maps with all the viewpoints neatly marked. You have to sit through YouTube videos like this to help you make your own list. And here is our recommendation. Mount Banks Lookout. This one involves half a kilometer of off-roading. Govet's Leap Lookout. Evans Lookout. Car Hills Lookout. Katumpa Falls. Echo Point and the Three Sisters Lookout. The last two being the most crowded. Last but not the least, the dramatic Lincoln's Rock Lookout where people risk life and limb for a few Instagram likes. We can never understand those people. We only do it for YouTube subscriptions. Lunch was at a Chinese restaurant at the Blue Mountains and dinner at the Thai town in Sydney. Both the meals were palatable but not great. This is our room in Sydney, the Great Southern Hotel. The hotel is very centrally located, just walking distance to the Thai town and the Chinatown. And the obligatory toilet picture. We ended the day at the Campbell Cove, where the cruise ships usually anchors. But more importantly for us, it is where you get the best night view of the Harbour Bridge, the Opera House and the Central Business District. In other words, the famous Sydney skyline. What a view to end the day with. What a stunning piece of architecture this is. Time to go speechless. Good morning. It's day four from Australia. And we are at the Queen Victoria building in Sydney. And today is all the sights of Sydney. The Queen Victoria building popularly known as the QVB, is a heritage building constructed in the Romanesque revival style between 1893 and 1898, making it one of the last Victorian era buildings in the country. It was originally constructed as a marketplace, later abandoned and has now been restored to serve the original purpose. Today it doubles up as a popular Instagram location of Sydney. The historic centre of Sydney is one of the highlights of the city. It is compact, extremely photogenic, a pleasure to roam around and well connected by the light rail. Taking the light rail cannot get any simpler. You just tap any credit card with touch access on your way in and out and you get billed automatically for your ride. And yes, Indian credit cards work just fine. We then walked along the waterfront to the Mrs. Macquarie's Point. This Mrs. Elizabeth Macquarie was the wife of Major General Macquarie, the then Governor of New South Wales. And this Macquarie's Point offers one of the best views of the Sydney skyline, the Opera House and the Harbour Bridge. The iconic Opera House was completed in 1973 based on the design made by the Danish architect Jorn Utzon 16 years earlier. The nearby 1.2 km long bridge is older having been built between 1923 and 1932 and its design is a copy of the Hell Gate Bridge in New York City. This type of bridge is known as a through arch bridge in which the base of the arch structure is below the deck but the top rises above it. Yes, half my friends are civil engineers. A short walk through the lush botanic gardens brought us to the state library. Although the library was established in 1826, the building only dates back to the early 1900s. Among its collection are the original journals of James Cook and Joseph Banks and the log of William Bly from the mutinous bounty. The highlight is the main reading room. Just one look will want you to stop wasting your time on YouTube videos and pick up a book. Thank you for curbing your urge and continuing to watch the video. Let's quickly move on to the art gallery of New South Wales. 
Established in 1874, it is one of the largest public galleries in Australia. But this is no Europe. Hence, you can see all of its permanent collection in less than an hour, and all its must sees are confined to a single floor. Here are the paintings generally regarded as its top five. At number five, Milford Sound with Pembroke Peak and Bowen Falls by Eugene van Kerarth. At number four, Portrait of Edward Art Detai by Basil Lemonnier. At number three, The Ferry by E. Philip Fox. At number two, On the Wallaby Track by Frederick McCubbin. At number one, The Golden Fleece by Tom Roberts. A short walk away is the largest cathedral of Sydney, St Mary's. The central nave is 106 meter long, the longest in the country. The cathedral was built between 1868 and 1905 in the Gothic Revival style, and the 75 meter spires were added only in the year 2000. Across the road sits the pretty Hyde Park. At its one end is the Arc de Co Arquibal Fountain, and its other end is the Anzac Memorial. Built in 1934 to honor the Australian Imperial Force of World War I, and in its center stands Rainer Hoff's sculpture Sacrifice. We ended the day at the world famous Bondi Beach, which would easily make it to the top five of any beach aficionado's list. The name Bondi actually comes from the word Boondi, no, not the Indian basin snack from which Laddu is made, but an Aboriginal word which means water tumbling over the rocks. Hello guys, it's day five from Australia. So we spent the whole morning getting to Uluru, and we are at the Uluru National Park. There are way too many flies here. Visiting Uluru is not cheap or easy. Direct flights to Uluru from Sydney cost three hundred and ten US dollars per head. Alice Springs is the nearest big city, and flying there is cheaper, but that is still five hours drive away. That's the car we rented. 120 US dollars per day plus additional 25 cents per kilometer fuel and insurance of course is extra the cheapest room in town is 180 US dollars per night and that puts you in a room with no running water no toilet no wash basin and our flight out was 410 US dollars per head the flight dropped us in uluru at 1 pm and after the car rental formalities we did a quick check in Wolf down a veggie pizza and rushed to the Kata Juta National Park. Kata Juta means many heads in Pidjan Jajara. Yes, that's the name of the local language. Kata Juta is a conglomeration of 36 giant boulders rising abruptly from the Great Australian Outback. It is a sight to behold, which by itself would have worth all the trouble and money to get here. But since these rocks find themselves within a grocery run distance from one of planet's most recognized natural formations, they usually find themselves lonely and devoid of tourists. It is a pity we did not budget more time. We would have loved to walk at least one of its trails. Finally, the highlight, Uluru. This imposing monolith has a perimeter of 9.4 kilometers, length of 3.6 kilometers, and a maximum height of 348 meters. This place was known to the local Anangu for at least 10,000 years. The first westerner to see it was the surveyor William Goss in 1873, who named it as the Ayers Rock in honor of the then Chief Secretary of South Australia, Sir Henry Ayers. Although considered sacred to the Anangus, visitors were allowed to climb Uluru, but as of 26 October 2019, climbing the formation has been permanently banned. The rock is best viewed during sunset. Watching the immovable giant change its color as the sun's angle changes is a truly moving experience. How do you put a price on this? An experience of a lifetime. Well and truly priceless. morning it's a day 6 from australia so we will be flying to canes in a few hours and it's bye bye to uluru national park flies are of biblical proportions here braving them gave us one last chance to view the rock before catching our flight to canes this time at sunrise this is our room in canes a motel apartment 
the best room we have stayed so far on this trip very spacious that's the bed and uh, spacious toilet for lunch we are eating what we bought at the airport uh, in IS Rock Keynes is so far up north that it is warm and muggy whereas Melbourne was quite chilly in the stopsy turvy world it gets warm as you go north Keynes is so far up north that it is surrounded by rainforests not any old rainforest but the oldest the dane tree unfortunately getting there and back takes an entire day and we only had one full day at canes and we wanted to spend that at the other natural wonder but we still had an afternoon to kill we spent that walking the 3 km long beach boardwalk or the esplanade which ended at this wonderful public pool we also stopped by this modern cathedral with some interesting stained glasses and we also got to see some birds there were no cassowaries but for people from india this very sort of rick enough good morning it's day 7 from australia uh, so we're going to spend the entire day uh, around the great barrier reef the great barrier reef the largest coral reef system in the world is composed of close to 3000 individual reefs and you have to take a private tour to visit them all tours have a dedicated private pontoon a large contraption bobbing around a secluded reef The tour boats take you to the set pontoon and you can spend the entire day there before it brings you back. There are several activities that you can do once you get there. Some are included in the trip cost like the underwater viewing deck, glass bottom boat ride, semi submersible ride and self snorkeling. Some are paid like guided snorkeling, helmet diving, regular diving and helicopter rides. We did the free stuff plus the guided snorkeling. The downside to all this is that there is no solid ground between the start and the finish. We both are so motion sick prone that action scenes in movie theaters make us squeezy. We have to hire body doubles to watch Rajinikanth fight scenes. And this was autumn with seas rough enough to convince Blackbeard to give up on piracy. But just like Uluru, the few minutes we spent on the guided snorkeling was enough to compensate for all the troubles. All the video footage is from my camera taken from the underwater viewing area or the semi submersible. All still pictures are by the official photographer of Reef Magic Cruises, the company with whom we booked the tour. We do recommend them. The photographer was taking the pictures of what I saw while I was hanging on for dear life like this. Good morning. It's day 8 from Australia. Uh so we are going to fly back to Melbourne today. It's bye bye to Cairns. and that flight is about as long as the longest flight you can take within india delhi port blair for comparison brisbane perth would be 5 and a half to 6 hours after reaching melbourne we took the sky bus to the city the bus runs every 15 minutes and is quite convenient but the tickets cost 23 australian dollars per head one way and that means if you are 3 people or more taxi would be more economical this is our room in melbourne ibis styles kings gate and the obligatory toilet shot bang next to our hotel is saravana bhavan and we finally had dosas after 8 days now it was about 2 pm which gave us enough time to squeeze in a couple of activities the first a visit to the magnificent national gallery of victoria founded in 1861 it is australia's oldest and most visited art museum It had a wonderful section of 20th century aboriginal art. Just like Sydney, the gallery was compact enough to be covered in a couple of hours. And here are our top 5 picks from its 19th century Australian art collection. At number 5, The Buffalo Ranges by Nicolas Chevalier. At number 4, Hudson's Bay by Thomas Robertson. At number 3, Nile River by John Glover. at number 2 the pioneer by fredrick mccabin and at number 1 sharing the rams by tom roberts the second activity was to walk the yara river promenade we started at the federation square which was being decked up for the buddha purnima and we walked along the south bank of the yara river which gave us some splendid views of the central business district in other words the melbourne skyline and thanks to one of aparna's high school friends who treated us to a fabulous dinner 
we got to see the famed skyline by night as well good morning folks so it's the last day from our trip to australia and we'll be seeing all the sights of melbourne today we are now at the shrine of remembrance a war memorial built in 1934 to honor the men and women of victoria who served in the first world war but now it functions as a memorial to all australians who have served in any war the classical design is inspired by the tomb at halicarnassos and the site offers wonderful views of the melbourne city from its steps a short walk away are the lungs of melbourne the royal botanic gardens of victoria after filling our lungs with some fresh air we headed what in our opinion the highlight of melbourne its library the state library of victoria was established in 1854 as the melbourne public library making it australia's oldest public library and one of the first free libraries in the world it is also australia's busiest public libraries and top 5 busiest in the world the landmark domed reading room was opened in 1913 and was designed by norman g peebles The 6-story high octagonal space is about 35 meters in both diameter and height and its oculus is nearly 5 meters wide. If this room doesn't inspire you to pick a book, let's not go there again, shall we? Let's move on to the museum. The Melbourne Museum, an absolute must see for families with kids, focuses on the natural and cultural history of Victoria. It has a wonderful dinosaur gallery housing the famous Horridus. the most complete triceratops fossil on the planet our final stops were the two impressive cathedrals of melbourne first st patrick's which was built between 1858 and 1939 in the gothic revival style the spires especially the 105 meter tall central one are truly impressive the second cathedral st paul's is also built in the same gothic revival style st paul's was completed in 1891 but got its inspirational spires also in the 1930s melbourne was founded in 1835 the then prime minister of uk was lord melbourne and the queen was victoria the city and the state were obviously named after them it is no surprise that melbourne the city houses some of the architectural gems from the victorian era such as the royal exhibition building built in 1880 as a part of the international exhibition movement hotel windsor built in 1884 it is the city's only surviving victorian era hotel the princess theater built in 1854 and later rebuilt in 1886 melbourne town hall built in 1887 it is still the administrative seat of the local municipality the old treasury building built between 1858 and 1862 and housed the treasury department the forum theater this is not victorian it looks old but only dates from 1929 And finally the stride stopping Flinders Street railway station built in 1854 it is the oldest and the busiest station in Australia apart from the buildings the other worthy mentions include the ubiquitous trams which come in all shapes and sizes this recently built coles fountain and this graffiti filled street hosier lane melbourne's most celebrated lane for street art and an irresistible magnet for the instagram crowd That's it folks this ends our trip to Australia uh, this was a very hectic trip uh, we had four flights to catch and if any of them had got delayed the trip would have fallen apart thankfully everything went as per plan uh, the weather also cooperated till we had the wonderful weather throughout except it was a bit cold and yeah this was one of our best trips and here is aparna running down through the top 10 sites of the trip at number 10 would be the state library of victoria at melbourne number 9 would be the cathedrals of melbourne number 8 would be the teddy's lookout on the great ocean road number 7 would be the bondi beach in sydney number 6 is the lincoln rock at the blue mountains national park number 5 the melbourne skyline number 4 the apostles on the great ocean road number 3 would be the great barrier reef Number 2 the Sydney Opera House and number 1 would be the Uluru Sunset View. So we are recording our final words at the Royal Botanical Gardens in Melbourne. Okay Aparna what was your best experience? Uh, my best experience on this trip was the snorkeling in the Great Barrier Reef. Actually it was very well done. I could even get uh, prescription goggles for rent. 
and the entire dress everything was on hire and uh, it was a very nice experience so the boat was uh, docked in a place and then a guided trip uh, under the surface so wonderful that was the best experience of the trip uh, i'll stick with the food as usual uh, the best experience was uh, finding vegetarian food everywhere we didn't expect uh, australia to have so much vegetarian option uh, the vegetarian vegan option was available absolutely everywhere including the flights uh, almost all restaurants had an exclusive vegan uh, or vegetarian menu i would say this is the best country for vegetarians we have visited so far better than even india that was quite a surprise uh, the best was the baked goods even the packed goods we found in 7-11 was utterly delicious okay that's it folks until we say hi from some other part of the world bye bye bye